I'm Maxime Patu. I'm, I'm uh, a research fellow that is working uh, in Lane Fox with uh, Dr. Hart. So as you may have already spotted, I'm French, so I'm sorry for that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I will try to do my best to have some proper accent and that kind of thing. So uh, just a first question so I can get an idea. How many of you are using EIT, electrical impedance tomography, in clinical practice? No, all right. Just, just a few. So you, you can ask uh, to the people at Breggers on the next break uh, more details. So I, I, I'll try to convince you that it can be a useful tool. But I don't have any conflict of interest uh, to, uh, on this topic. So the first thing uh, is a question. What do you think that this is? It's not a flute. It's something that French can do sometimes when they are not striking, is finding new things to assess what is happening inside the patient's chest. And this is the first stethoscope that has been uh, invented by Leine back in the 19th century. And really, since then, not only the French, but the doctors have been working quite hard to have a better understanding of what is happening inside the patient body. Because we see that body, but we need to see what is happening inside. And I could have made a much more bigger slide or smaller images, because there is so much imaging technique that you can think of that sometimes you just have to think what is the use of them. So you have obviously the CT, which is great because you have a high resolution, you get nice picture, you see uh, almost a histological pattern when you look onto uh, interstitial disease, but the problem is that you have radiation, and the problem is when you have patients yeah, in IRDS, it might be a bit difficult to move them to the CT. Chest x-ray is good, ultrasound are great, but not a lot of detail. And if you want to have a lot of detail, you can have some very nice imaging techniques. So here it's what we call confocal microscopy, so you do that during a bronchoscopy. And the line that you are seeing here are the alveoli. So when you have the probe inside, you can see the alveoli filling in and filling out. And if there is any cell in it, some macrophage, some inflammation, you will see it directly. You can also use optical coherence tomography. So you use light, light wave during the bronchoscopy. And what you see here is the epithelium of the bronchi. You can see the smooth muscle. You can see secretion. So you can go into a lot, a lot of detail. So we have a lot of imaging technique. And so the question is, really, with all the things that we have, and I've not mentioned all of them, do we really need a new imaging technique that we will have to learn, that we will have to understand? That's uh, a good question. And I think that the answer to that question is yes, because despite having a lot of imaging technique, they all have the downsides. And if you look at the city, you have the radiation, and it's not a, bed, a bedside tool. If you look at the invasive uh, bronchoscopy feature. It gives you lots of detail, but probably too many details. And that's not how you're going to assess the whole uh, uh, of your patients. Ultrasound, they are great. You can do them in ICU. It's been a, a huge change in the clinical practice. But you don't get a lot of resolution because the, uh, the lungs, are the, the ultrasound are not going well through air, and the lungs are filled with air. So. Having the electrical impedance tomography, because of all these reasons, makes sense. And I will just start the introduction with, with some principle on how it works, and then we will move to the clinical practice. And basically, electricity has changed everything in the early 20s. It makes you waste uh, thinner. It helps you have some muscle. And you can see that the EIT belt is not so far away from this one. Uh, you can have electric airbrushes, I don't even want to know what it does, but you, you can do it. So electricity, it's been, it's very electricity in the 20th century. But how does it work inside the lungs and for the uh, uh, EIT device? So basically, when you send an electrical current inside uh, your body, you have some resistance, and the intensity of the signal is decreased. And what is nice about the lungs is, in most of the cases, they are breathing in and out, filling in and filling out. So when you are breathing out, your impedance is well lower than when you are breathing in, and the machine is going to be able to capture this difference. And the way that it's work is so you have here the, electric, uh, the electrical wavelength that is going through the alveoli, and when you are breathing in, 
the length is bigger, so your impedance is bigger, and when you're breathing out, it goes back to normal. So that's the principle then you have to do to put in, in the machine to be able to have some images because otherwise it doesn't make a lot of sense. So the way that the EIT devices are, are all working is basically you have a belt with electrodes, usually 16 electrodes, and a first electrode will send an electrical impulse that will be captured by the other 14 electrodes and by doing that you will be able to draw a map of uh, the diffusion of the electricity. And you do that around the patient, just like a city would go around the patient, and by doing that you are able to produce a detailed imaging of what is happening. What is very important to understand when you are speaking about EIT is first the spatial resolution, which is good but not great, as if you saw the resolution is 32 pixel by 32 pixel. If you had to compare with the city, the city is 500 pixel by 500 pixel. So you won't, be, you won't have such a refined image that you will get from the city. But the difference from the city is that you have a very high temporal resolution because the images are produced uh, you produce 50 images per second, which means that if your patient is breathing at a respiratory rate of 20, uh, you will have more uh, a 1,000 images of the breathing of your patient. So you have a real-time imaging, and that is one of the most important features of the EIT. So to put it into action and into context, so that's a patient that is breathing in, and you can see here the change in the electrical impedance, which looks like exactly some volume waveform, and you can see, so when it's dark, it's not, br it's breathe out, when it's getting blue and white, it's breathing in, and the more that you are breathing in, the whiter it gets. So you have this kind of imaging when you are doing the EIT. How does it work when you <coughs> do it in clinical <coughs> practice? So this is the machine that you can see, it weighs around 60 kilos, so it's transportable but not portable unless you are as strong as the, <laughs> the um, uh, research nerd that was doing the small study. And that's the setup. So you have the device that is connected through a wire to the patient and you have the electrical belt that is measuring the lung impedance in real time. And you can see directly on the screen uh, of the machine the waveform and the distribution of the ventilation. So you get very nice pictures, and obviously we all love <laughs> nice pictures, but then you have to look a little bit more into details, and this is the kind of things that you can get out from these images. So the first thing is the volume. As you have seen when you're breathing in, you change the impedance, so this change in the electrical impedance of the lung is correlated to the volume, so you have the tidal volume of your patient. The other information that you have is the end expiratory lung impedance, which means that when you end up breathing in, that's the impedance that is left, and that is quite correlated to the end expiratory lung volume or when you are solventing the uh, functional residual capacity. So uh, that's the value that you get. You also get the distribution of the ventilation. As we can see in this uh, graph, you can divide your image in a uh, region of interest and have <coughs> the tidal volume of each region of interest and that's, what, uh, that's something that is very useful for the EIT. Based on that, you can calculate where is the center of gravity, if it's more anterior or posterior, and obviously with the patient with ARDS, when all the bases are filled with, uh, with uh, junk and, uh, and inflammation, you have a center of gravity that is more interior, and when you recruit the patient, it will be more in the middle. Another way to assess that is the homogeneity of the ventilation. So they have an inhomogeneity index, which is the opposite, and basically it gives you an idea on how homogeneous your ventilation is. The last thing that you can get, and you can get a lot of other things, but the mains are here, it's the, syn the kinetics of the ventilation. You can see if one part of the lung is inflating later than the other one, and you can also calculate the compliance the impedance compliance of your patient. So this is roughly what you can get from the EIT, lots of detailed information. So if you don't have any question, we're gonna to move to the uh, clinical application. All right. So 
Well, so I will mainly uh, speak for the first bit about uh, ARDS because that's uh, uh, you, you, the, your main focus as uh, intensivist. And basically, what uh, has gone uh, has gained much more interest over the last decade is lung protective ventilation. And one of the ways is to set up the PIP uh, properly. So this is a study that has been done in patients. So you have a cohort of 18 patients with acute lung injury and a cohort of eight patients that were included in the study uh, before uh, orthopedic surgery. So their lungs were fine. And so they have done EIT on it during a, a, a recruitment maneuver with a constant flow to reach the maximum value. And so you can see on this graph the pressure and you can see the, square, the, the, the circle here and the square. They correspond to two different regions of the lung. The square is on the back, uh, the circle is on the back, and the square is on uh, the top. And you can calculate when this particular region of the lung is opening. So to do so, you calculate when you have more than 10% of change in the impedance at the end of expiration. And when you have 10% of change, that means that this region of the lung has started to bring, and that's when you have started to open in a way you are only in this region. And you can calculate that for 32 by 32 pixel uh, of the lung. And as you can see on this graph, the square that is more ventral opens with a much lower pressure than the circle which is on the back because you don't have the gravity effect. So if you look at the difference between healthy and a patient with acute lung injury, what you can see, so this is all the pixels of the patient, so when they are open, when they reach the 10% increase of the impedance, and you can see that in healthy, obviously, it's always a bit uh, a bit higher in the dorsal part uh, of the lung, but the distribution of the opening pressure in patients with acute lung injury is much more heterogeneous and it can go up to, uh, to, to a pressure of 20. So you can get a good idea of what are the opening pressure and what is most important is that you have a good feeling of what is happening when you are increasing the pressure and what kind of level of PIP you will need to rec recruit the dorsal part of the lung. One other way to do this, the, this kind of assessment, so this one is not with uh, human, it's uh, uh, with uh, pigs and you can see that they were assessing, using different level of PIP, the delay of ventilation. What does it mean? The red part of uh, the graph here is when the lung is opening at, uh, later, more than 40% uh, later than the first opening of uh, when you start to breathe in. And as you increase the PIP, you get a more, much more greener uh, picture, which means that all the parts of the lungs are now open at the same time. And obviously, you can have the same picture using CT. But the difference is that if you want to do that with a patient, you will have to go to the city, you will spend more than an hour uh, doing the city, and it's much more convenient to do that with the EIT when you can use it at the bedside. Another way to assess uh, <coughs> the recruitment of your patient is when you assess, uh, as I said, the homogeneity of the ventilation. So here you have a ramp uh, in, in PIP, so if they use higher, higher, higher PIP in patients with acute lung injury, and you have the inhomogeneity index. So the higher it is, the more heterogeneous your ventilation is, the more you are breathing with only certain part of the lung, and the less you are breathing with the other one. And as you can see, so you increase the PIP, and when you reach a PIP of 14 for this patient, the inhomogeneity index was very low, which means that the ventilation was homogeneous around the lung which corresponds quite nicely to uh, a picture when everything is green. Green is good, as always. So um, in homogeneity, ventilation delay, and expiratory lung volume, they are a way to assess the recruitment of the patient. But as intensivist, you are also interested in not over your patient, because if you over then you will induce a uh, ventilator-induced lung injury. And there is a way to assess that using the EIT. And this is, once again, a study uh, on animals, so not on human, but you can, uh, it will be, uh, it has been applied already, but not in, uh, in such an extensive way in human. You can calculate from the EIT images 
the region of the lung that uh, following your PIP increase, you are stopped to ventilate, that is always inflated, and that gives you the proportion of distension. And it's quite great to do the titration of your NIV. You can see, if you uh, superpose the two things, you can see the recruitment of the bases and the over distension, and then probably the next step of using NIV is guiding your ventilation using the EIT data to minimize over distension and to maximize uh, recruitment so that you have the best ventilation with, uh, so the best uh, oxygenation with uh, the less lung injury. So this is the work that I've been uh, published by uh, Luigi that uh, talks to you better. It was two patients that were referred uh, to St. Thomas's for ECMO, and the patient had a similar clinical presentation, and they've done, uh, they studied the compliance of the patients. So one had a very uh, poor compliance the, uh, during the recruitment ma maneuver, and one had a much better one when you were looking at the usual way to look at uh, compliance. When you look at the way that the compliance was assessed by the EIT, you can see similarly that this patient, patient A, didn't have any improvement of his compliance despite having higher PIP, whereas the other one has an improvement. And what is quite interesting to see in that patient, if even you get the same result using a different technique, EIT versus standard technique, you can see for this patient, the regional compliance. So you can compare the ventral compliance to the dorsal compliance. And what is quite interesting is that on the dorsal region of the lung, the best compliance was around 22 uh, of PIP, whereas on the ventral uh, po position, it was around, uh, around 10. And that means that there was a big discrepancy uh, in this patient between the ventral, or the recruitment of the ventral lung of the lung and the back, which means that probably this patient will have a better response than the other one, for example, <coughs> to prone positioning, because you will change uh, the driving pressure, and that's something that can be for which the EIT is useful. Another way is for COPD patients. So this is once again a case report, and it's been quite nicely done. So you have on the uh, upper graph the pressure that is given to the patient. So the patient was sedated, and uh, it was uh, the machine that was doing all the work. And so they were decreasing the pressure. As you end expiratory lung pressure, uh, correlates with your end expiratory lung volume and correlates with your, lung, uh, your end expiratory lung impedance, when you decrease the, uh, the PIP, you decrease the end expiratory lung impedance. So they've decreased two centimeters by two centimeters. And what you can see is for the first three uh, decrease in pressure, you have a decrease in the lung impedance, in the end expiratory lung impedance. But when you go to 10 of PIP, you reach a minimal value of end expiratory lung impedance. And despite decreasing again the pressure, you don't change the end expiratory lung impedance. That means that you don't, say, you don't change the end expiratory lung volume. And that means that the end expiratory lung volume is now driven by the increasing PIP of the patient, which means that if you want to successfully win this patient, you have to target the uh, interesting PIP and you have to set up your pressure at 10 when you see that it's the moment of, of transition. So quite a nice way to uh, evaluate the non-invasively the interesting PIP of the patients. And while we are speaking about all the COPD, all the asthmatic patients, so this is on stable patients, so it's not ICU patient, but just to give you more thoughts on how you could use it, the EIT is a great tool because you assess the regional ventilation. That means that it's a little bit like having a lung function uh, inside in, in, in the ICU. And you can also assess the homogeneity of the ventilation. So after a bronchodilator, asthmatic patients do improve, which, which you can pick, uh, see with uh, the EIT. But also, you can see that the inhomogeneity of the ventilation is decreasing. That means that you have a better uh, ventilation because you, have, uh, get, you, you get rid of 
the obstruction of the patient. And probably that could be a, EIT could be a good, good tool when you're trying to change settings, you're increasing PIP, when you're trying to assess the efficacy of bronchodilatator in patients that are very uh, severe. And we know that these patients are sometimes quite difficult uh, to ventilate despite not having uh, ARDS. In a more anesthetical approach, you can use the EIT to make sure that you have uh, a selective intubation, if that's what you want. So uh, when you're planning surgery, you can guide the insertion of the tube using this technique. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it's one, one way to assess. And I think one thing, one si clinical situation which is more interesting is a patient with lung transplant. So this is once again a clinical case uh, of a patient that has single lung transplant. And even if it, the left lung doesn't look very good, it's the new lung, and the right lung is the uh, COPD uh, emphysematous lung that is left in the patient. And this patient developed uh, acute respiratory failure, and it was difficult to ventilate because he has a native lung, which is pretty bad, which will uh, uh, have a distension where the other one was pretty healthy. And it was quite important in that case to have the EIT because when they have done the CT, they showed that the patient had a uh, uh, PE on the right, uh, right, uh, right main artery uh, pulmonary. But as the EIT didn't show any ventilation on the right side, that means that the, the PE was not the main reason of the acute respiratory failure. And the main reason of this respiratory failure was the fact that there was an infection going on on the transplanted lung. So you can have a lot, a lot of situations when EIT is useful, and basically you have to think about your patients, you have to think about probably the patients that are difficult to ventilate, the ones that are at high risk, in order to optimize your ventilation. So here I, I won't go through all of that because uh, we won't have the time, but you have a lot of things that you can use the EIT for because you can leave the EIT on forever because it doesn't give any radiation. It's not a problem, it's not painful. So you can use it, for example, to detect pneumothoraces that can happen in patients with uh, ARDS despite uh, protected ventilation. And you will see that this patient was doing well. He had a drop. In, uh, he had one area of his lung that was not ventilated, and that can give you the answer straight away uh, this, uh, without waiting for the chest x-ray to come. In these patients that are quite frail, it can be a very useful to act uh, very uh, rapidly. To conclude, non-invasive imaging technique that you can <coughs> use at the bedside, and it's really useful uh, as a tool to understand the ventilation, and it's a tool that gives you lots of information, and that I think can help you provide to the patient a better ventilation. Thanks.